Hi, good evening. As mentioned, my name is Joe, and I work on the Go team in Sunnyvale on libraries for building Google infrastructure. I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about forward compatible Go code. Now, I know Russ just started the conversation about Go too, so I want to be explicit that this talk is about compatibility within the Go 1X series of releases. For example, 1.9, 1.10, and 1.11, and so on. But the same basic principles covered today still apply in Go 2. So before I get started, who's excited for Go 1.9? Woo! All right. Can you please raise your hand if you've tried running Go 1.9 on your code base? Raise them up high. All right. Great, that's a fair number of you. Keep your hands raised. Here's a follow-up question. Keep your hands raised if you successfully ran Go 1.9 without any failures. And if you did run into failures, take them down. OK, that's pretty good. So it seems that some of you were not able to upgrade without any issues. So what's going on here? Some important goals for Go are stability and development scalability. In theory, the team of worldwide contributors developing Go should be able to improve the tool chain without breaking the code of those who depend on it. However, in practice, as we see here today, that is not always the case. What's going on is an observation that we at Google call Hiram's Law. Hiram's law reads, with a sufficient number of users of an API, it does not matter what you promised in the contract, all observable behaviors of your interface will be depended upon by somebody. You see, when breakages occur trying to run Go 1.9 on your code base, it means that something somewhere in your code is depending on some behavior specific to 1.8 that no longer behaves the exact same way in 1.9. These differences in behavior alter the control flow of your program, resulting in bugs and test failures. In Hiram's Law, I want to highlight the word contract. The contract is the set of exported package identifiers and associated documentation that promises what an API will do for you. It specifies the guaranteed behavior that your program may rely upon. But if you depend on unspecified behavior, you are treading in murky waters. To ensure that future versions of Go continue to run old Go code, we have our own contract, which is commonly known as the Go1 compatibility promise. The compatibility promise covers a wide range of topics, including security, bugs, use of struct literals and methods, use of unsafe, and so on. We don't have time to cover every aspect of the compatibility promise, so I encourage you to read the entire document online. Fundamentally, it was designed with the goal of creating a stable platform for the development of Go projects. It's an agreement between the users of Go and the authors of the Go toolchain, that is, the Go language specification and the standard library. If this agreement is met, then in theory, all Go 1 programs should be able to continue to compile and run correctly unchanged on all future Go 1 releases. Sorry. In practice, however, some of you do run into issues using newer releases of Go. This comes down to two primary causes. The first major cause of breakages is the Go programmer relying on behavior outside the compatibility agreement. The second major cause of breakages are faults in the tool chain where the Go compiler and or standard library changed the behavior it promised to have. One or both of these causes may be involved in any specific breakage. Let us focus first on breakages due to the programmer. 
A vast majority of the time, code is brittle because it unintentionally depends on unspecified behavior. As part of my job, I deploy the latest Go toolchain across all Go code at Google. From this experience, I want to share three categories of erroneous assumptions that I've seen repeatedly lead to brittle and buggy code in the hopes that you can avoid making similar mistakes. The first category of erroneous assumptions is that the output of a package will be stable from release to release. Here we have a list of packages that users often incorrectly assume to be stable. Each of these packages does guarantee that the output is compliant with the targeted specification. For example, the JSON package outputs valid JSON. However, unstable output means that it is not safe to assume that the outputs are byte for byte identical. This often fails in tests that are written like this. Imagine that you wrote a serialization package that performs some type of encoding and decoding. As part of its serialization process, your package depends on the JSON package. When testing your package's functions, you might want to pass some hard-coded raw test data into encode and check that the result exactly matches some hard-coded pre-serialized test data. Similarly, you might pass that same serialized data into decode and check that the decoded value exactly matches the raw data. At first glance, this seems reasonable. However, this is actually problematic. When you upgrade to a newer version of Go, the JSON package that you depend on may now output something slightly different, causing your test to fail the byte for byte comparison test. Instead, a better way to structure this test is to round trip the encoder output back into the decoder and ensure that you retrieve the same input. This approach, rel uh, this approach re avoids relying on the JSON package's output being stable and only relies on its ability to parse valid JSON. Even more serious than broken tests, I have seen this cause bugs in production code, such as this example. Here we have a type record where one of the fields is a timestamp in seconds. In order to obtain a unique identifier for each record, an ID method returns the SHA-256 checksum of the JSON encoded struct. However, as seen in blue, this is problematic because the JSON representation of the timestamp differs between releases. On Go 1.7, the output of serializing floats in JSON use exponential notation, while Go 1.8 prefer decimal notation for a wider range of values. When this record is stored into the database on one release of Go, it cannot be properly retrieved in a later release since the ID has changed. Bugs of this nature are surprising and extremely difficult to track down. One way to fix this is to write your own struct marshalling, where you can guarantee output stability or use a package that guarantees canonical serialization, which has the property of output stability. The second category of erroneous assumptions is assuming that all values may be directly compared using the equality operator. Several types that are generally not safe to directly compare are time.time, .time, errors, and any type you don't own unless otherwise documented. Relative, relevant to the upcoming Go19 release is the recording of a monotonic clock into the time type, for, which provides a more precise measurement of elapsed time. By design, the monotonic reading cannot be serialized. So round trip marshalling and unmarshalling a time loses any monotonic information. 
as seen in blue, T1 contains a monotonic reading, while T2 does not. Other than that, they represent the exact same time instant. At the bottom, we see that both the equality operator and reflect.deep equal report that T1 and T2 are different. However, the equal method properly reports that these two times are the same. If you read the documentation for time, you will see that it actually encourages use of the equal method instead of the equality operator. The reason why the equality operator gets this wrong is because it compares the underlying unexported fields of time without taking into account that the same time instant may have multiple representations. Relying on comparability of time can lead to serious bugs. In this example, we have a shared map called pending that is keyed by time and is accessed by two different sections of code. The first section inserts a record into the pending map using the timestamp as a key and then stores that record into a persistent queue for processing. The map insertion uses a time key which has the monotonic reading and the queue push actually strips the monotonic reading when marshalling. In a later section, the record is popped from the queue and an attempt is made to delete that record from the pending map. The queue load and map deletion use a time key that lacks a monotonic reading. This is problematic as the deletion does not occur due to differing keys. One way to fix this is to convert the time to the number of nanoseconds since the Unix epoch and use that instead as your map key. You have just seen two examples where relying on value comparability resulted in buggy code. How can you prevent this? For tests, reflect.deep equal is often the wrong choice because it blindly compares on the internal details of types and has no understanding of equal methods that package authors may have wanted you to use. To deal with brittle tests inside Google, we have open sourced a package on GitHub called Comp that avoids these two pitfalls. We invite you to try using package Comp to improve your tests if it is the right fit. Generally, in Go code, you should be careful about whether types are comparable, and if they are not, you should either use a custom definition of equality, like the equal method, or convert the value to a canonical form that is stable. The third category of erroneous assumptions is relying on the internals of the Go runtime. In each release of Go, the compiler is producing faster code and the garbage collector is getting smarter. After release, it's interesting to see the storm of bug reports about how the latest release broke a user's project, when in fact, it only uncovered a pre-existing race condition. The race detector has been instrumental in discovering these races by intentionally randomizing aspects of the runtime in an attempt to trigger detectable race conditions. Some, an example of runtime details that users have relied upon to their detriment is the ordering of when Go routines are scheduled which can be problematic when the ordering in which values appear in a channel changes as they are produced by several Go routines. Another example is relying on iterations over a map producing a deterministic ordering, an assumption that was broken by an improved implementation of maps. In order to reduce that type of failure, since Go 1.3, maps now provide a random iteration order. Other examples include relying on the exact timing of functions and the exact text output of panic messages or stack traces. 
One important detail about the runtime to mention is that unsafe is not forward compatible. The compatibility agreement actually reserves the right for the tool chain to make breaking changes. Now, we understand that use of unsafe is absolutely necessary in some applications. So we try very hard to avoid breaking unsafe code unnecessarily. But users of unsafe must be willing to update their code if necessary for future releases. Build tags can be used to isolate behavior that exists in one release of Go and not in another. To summarize, how can you write forward compatible Go code? First, I cannot stress this enough. It is in your best interest to spend a few minutes reading the documentation carefully in order to avoid introducing bugs that will later take you hours to debug. And if the documentation is not clear, we would appreciate if you could file an issue or even contribute a documentation fix. Secondly, be careful of what you hard code. Hard coding values often accidentally encodes assumptions about how the data was generated or is to be used. As if these assumptions are not backed by guaranteed behavior in the documentation, they may break your code in the future. Third, use the right comparison. In test, you may consider using the comp package that we recently released instead of reflect.deepEqual. In production code, you should either write your own equality functions or use a canonicalized form of the value that is safe to compare. Fourth, keep in mind that the race detector deliberately shakes up runtime implementation details. This can help you find existing race conditions that could manifest in future releases. Lastly, if you use package unsafe, be willing to update your code before each toolchain release. So we've looked at how breakages can occur because of erroneous assumptions made by Go programmers. The second cause of forward incompatible code is because the tool chain changed some behavior that it promised to have. In the development of the tool chain, we call these regression bugs, since the behavior regressed relative to a prior release. The developers of Go Toolchain are humans just like you, and bugs can and do get introduced that can break your code, and it's entirely our fault. As the developers of the toolchain, we have the responsibility that we adhere to the compatibility promise from our end. In order to explain how we uphold the promise, let's talk about the Go release process. The development of the Go toolchain is a six-month process that generally starts and ends in February and August. The first three months are spent developing new features, optimizing performance, refactoring code, and generally making higher risk changes. The later three months are spent in the development freeze where we focus on fixing bugs and improving documentation and generally stabilizing the tool chain. Throughout this process, we cut several preliminary snapshots of the tool chain and invite the Go community to test these in order to discover and fix bugs. It is also an opportunity for the community to test drive new APIs to discover any unforeseen pain points that may result in adjustments to the API before it becomes set in stone. About one month into the freeze, the beta is cut and is indicative that most known bugs are fixed and we are currently searching for unknown bugs. One month later, the release candidate is cut. This is a significant milestone in the development cycle as this cut of the tool chain is being used by default for production builds inside Google. 
All major bugs have been fixed, and it is a high confidence statement by the Go team that this, is, this cut is production quality. As seen, the release candidate is cut in July, and we hope to release it shortly. After one month, at the end of the cycle, after addressing new bug reports, we have the final release, which should only have minor changes from the release candidate. Throughout the entire development cycle, rigorous testing is performed. Every few days, a bleeding edge cut of the tool chain is used to build, run, and test in an enormous suite consisting of over a million targets of Google's production code. The purpose of this testing is to discover any regression failures. Some of these failures are the result of brittle code relying on erroneous assumptions. Others reveal a bug in the tool chain to fix upstream. The chart above shows the number of regression failures discovered on this test suite over the 1.8 cycle. Each bar in the chart shows the result of a test run where the blue bar tracks the current total number of failures. The red bar tracks, the, tracks new failures relative to the previous run, and the green bar tracks failures that have been fixed since the previous run. Here are some interesting observations that we can pull from this chart. First, even in a suite of a million targets, we don't see more than several hundred failures, which suggests either a fairly thorough code review process or that we have a talented colony of contributing gophers. Second, in the cycle, there are two regions of high activity where a fair number of regression failures are introduced. These regions correspond with the beginning of development and the freeze of development. You see, some gophers love doing their work early, batching up a number of changes to submit the moment development opens. Most other gophers, myself included, procrastinate until the development freeze, frantically trying to push their change through. The number of regression failures is proportional to the number of feature changes submitted. It is interesting to note that the climax occurs on October 31st, the day of the freeze. You see, the freeze is necessary as it intentionally impedes feature development so that we can fix regression bugs those changes may introduce. Without the freeze, these failures will continue to increase unbounded. Lastly, as we approach the cycle's end, once we have fixed all bugs that prevent Go from being production ready, we have the release. I share about our regression testing process to show the Go team's commitment to make each Go release the best release. However, as large as our test suite is, it is still a tiny fraction of all the Go code in the world, and is heavily tailored towards Google's Go code. Any code base of sufficient size will use Go in a way that is unique and that we did not test for. And for that reason, we need your help. We need your help to test new releases of Go. And here are some good reasons why. First, it is an excellent opportunity to contribute to the Go community. By reporting regression failures, you can help Go become the most reliable language platform, one that users have confidence in and choose over alternatives. Also, reporting regressions early allows Go to be released on time so that all of us can benefit sooner from upcoming features. Second, testing early is an investment in your own code base. Open source development of Go means that you have the unique opportunity to try out new APIs. If the API is clunky to use for your application, then early in the cycle is the time to provide that useful feedback. Otherwise, it's too late. It's also important for you to report unique regression bugs that affect your code. 
You see, if you don't report them, we can't fix them. Also, by shepherding your code base and fixing brittle code, you set yourself up to benefit from exciting new features sooner. For example, type aliases, monotonic timestamps, sync map, helper test functions, or the new bits package. So how can you easily test Go19 today? Actually, quite simply. You can go get this special package, Go19 Beta 2. Then run Go19 Beta 2 download to install the new tool chain. And then just invoke Go19 Beta 2 as if it were the normal Go command. Using this, you can run all your tests and build a 1.9 binary for your production canneries. If you run into failures, triage them and determine whether it's because of brittle code based on erroneous assumptions or a regression bug in the tool chain. If the latter, we would appreciate if you would file a bug report with a succinct reproduction case so that we may address it. All right, so if I did my job correctly, I shouldn't have to ask this, but who's going to test Go19? That was not, who's going to test Go19? Great. I expect to see bug reports by the end of tonight. Thank you for your time.